recording, welcome back, also if you're watching this on YouTube and Moodle. Um, let me switch the PowerPoint to the other one, which I should be able to do like this. Alright, so this is work in progress. I have written a paper, which we'll probably submit soon, um, and the title of the paper is Linear Mixed Model Multiple QTL Time Series Mapping. So it's a long title, um, but it's about how I use linear mixed models um, combined with multiple QTL mapping. So we'll just go through the slides and I will more or less explain what I did, why I did it, and why I think this is a good idea to do it like this. So first we will have a short introduction about linear mixed models. I will tell you about multiple QTL mapping, a little bit about the Berlin Fat Mouse, because we've been talking about it a lot, but I don't think that I actually showed you a picture of the mouse yet, so I will have to do that. Um, I will tell you about model selection, so how do you select which model is a better model than the other ones, um, and that again goes into the AIC. Of course there's many different ways of comparing models, not just the uh, AIC but you also have the BIC and you can look at the log likelihood. Um, and then I will show you how we dealt with litter size and litter number. Um, so litter size is if you have a female mice, mouse giving birth, um, then the birth weight of a of a litter is more or less a constant number. So it doesn't really matter if you have five offspring or if you have seven or nine offspring. Um, it just means that if you have seven offspring then every mouse being born is just a little bit smaller. Um, but more or less the, there is a constant factor there. The same thing holds for litter number. Um, the first time that a mouse gives birth the, the litter tends to be a little bit um, smaller um, compared to the next one. So if, if it's the first time giving birth you generally end up with a slightly smaller litter compared to the second or the third litter from the same mouse. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the results that we got and a little bit about the conclusion and discussion. Um, let me actually move this up a little bit because the logo is out of range and then I have to move this one as well a little bit. So I'm hoping that, yeah, now the logo fits. All right, so a short uh, introduction in linear mixed models, right? So it's an extension to linear models, like we just discussed, allowing for a combination of fixed and random effects. Um, at Testosaurus, oh, okay, that's just a internal chat thing. So fixed effects are uh, model parameters that are fixed, non-random quantities, um, and we've seen a lot of them. Things like sex is of course a fixed effect and it makes generally a big difference. Um, but the, the thing that you have to remember is this, that if you are modeling something, then Including something as a fixed effect is always correct. It is a non-biased estimate for this parameter. A random effect is a model parameter which is considered as a random variable. Um, and this means that there is a hierarchy in this variable, right? It's a grouping variable. It groups things together. And the advantage of using random effects means that it is, it is efficient. Um, as such, random mixed effect models are good at dealing with things like repeated measurements. Yeah, because it, you can group the measurements and say these are all measurements of a single mouse, um, so they belong together and they should not add to my statistical power. Um, and there are a lot of things that you can say about linear mixed models and yeah, there's like a whole field of research behind uh, when are you allowed to use a certain parameter as a fixed effect and when are you allowed to put it in as a random effect um, and that's something that like if you you could you could do a whole PhD study, uh, study about it. So as an example I just took this from Wikipedia um, imagine that you have a large elementary school from a single country um, so M um, then we have um, so M elementary schools, we have n pupils that are chosen randomly at each school, and then we look at test scores, so why, uh, so the test score is our predictor, right, because we want to know if some schools are better than other schools, um, and then the, the yij is the score of the jth pupil at the yth school. 
So of course, when we do a random effects example, then we are going to say that, well, the scores that we are going to get is something based on uh, the overall mean, because there's just a global mean. And then we have U, which is a school specific random effect. And then we have an individual specific random effect, right? So um, M and the Mu is the average test score of the entire population. We have UI, which is the school specific random effect, the difference between the average score at school I and the average school in the entire country so it's it's the the school effect relative to the average um, and then we have the individual specific random effect which is the ijth pupil score from an average of the ith school right because every individual score slightly higher or slightly lower than the school average so fixed effects can capture differences in schools among different groups across different schools. So for example, we can have things like the sex of the individual. Are you a male or a female, which might influence your score. Uh, we can have something like race, like if you are white or if you're black or if you're Chinese. Um, and of course, we can have things like the parent education level, which also might have an effect on the score of an individual. Right, so, and these are all effects which are individual specific. That's why they get the IJ, well, the school only gets I, right? Because I is the, the school effect and IJ is an effect which is um, independent, uh, which is interested, or IJ is an effect which is measured on a single individual on a single school. So we can extend our model saying that, well, the test score that you get is based on the global mean. Then we have a whole bunch of parameters in which we are interested because we want to know if guys or girls are scoring better at a certain test. Um, we can look at the effect of race or we can look at the effect of the education of the parents, right? So we have three betas here that we want to estimate. So that's kind of how linear or, or how linear models works right you, so you 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 do measurements and then you try to kind of assign the variance of the different measurements to the different components in your model um, so hey, when we talk about multiple QTL mapping that's slightly different but normally multiple QTL mapping is done just using standard linear models and so um, what is did I actually explain to you guys what QTL mapping is I probably didn't right or did I do that? Did, yeah, you, I probably didn't because I think that I did this presentation for a bunch of people that knew what QTL mapping is. Yeah, I think I, I think we did it in the bioinformatics course, but we didn't do it here. Um, so let me very quickly, very, very quickly, let me get my drawing board back and um, Let's get it here as well, and I want to have a pen, and I'm just going to very, very quickly tell you guys what is QTL mapping. Right, so QTL mapping is a method to find um, trait associations with the genome. So what do we have? Well, we generally have a population. For example, we have a population which is created by taking, um, and then I have to go here. So we have, for example, our Berlin fat mouse, so BFMIs, right? Um, and then we cross our BFMI with a B6, right? So now all the individuals coming out will be F1 individuals. So each individual, so if you look at the genome, so for example, chromosome one, right? Then one of the chromosomes will be from the BFMI in white and the other one will come from uh, a B6, right? So every chromosome, because you get two, one from your father, one from your mother. So chromosome one will look like this. So the individuals coming out are called heterozygotes, um, meaning that they have one chromosome which comes from BFMI and one chromosome which comes from B6. So let's use blue for B6 all, all the time, right? So now what are we going to do? We're going to make a new cross in which we say, well, we take two of these individuals, right? So we take a heterozygote BFMI B6 and we cross it with a another heterozygote. So I have to kind of do it like this, right? So we take two of these mice and then we cross them together, right? So now what happens is when we cross this mouse, we get a new mouse and this mouse has um, a genome, but this genome is interesting, right? Because th what happens is you have recombinations in biology. So what, what happens when you cross a mouse with another mouse is that the genome will have a random crossover at a certain point. 
when you cross these two mice. Of course this also happens when you do it here, but if a BFMI allele crosses over with a BFMI allele, you just get a BFMI allele, and the same thing happens for B6. But now since every individual has two versions of chromosome 1, we get mice which look kind of like this. Oh, that's, that's bad, I don't want to put this thing here. So now when I look at chromosome 1 of, of a certain mouse, then the chromosome 1 of this mouse will look more or less like this. So some parts will be white and white, right? Because it, it inherited this allele from the father, this allele from the mother. Some parts of the genome will look like this. So I get a part of the BFMI, original founder, and I get a little part of the... Where's my blue color? There. So I get a little part of the B6. Of course, it can be that the next part of the genome, I am unlucky or lucky and I get two times an allele from the B6. And of course, it could be the other way around as well, where I get a color which is the opposite, where I, for example, get a part of the genome from the BFMI on this side and I get a part of the B6 on the other side. Right, so what we are kind of doing is we are mixing these two genomes. And we can, we can mix that. So if we now look at a single genetic marker, how does dominance... Uh, then we'll, we'll get to that. That's when you have a whole population and you look at a phenotype, right? But this is just about the, the genetics, right? So it's, it's just about what, what part of the genome is inherited from what, right? So now we can have a certain genetic marker, um, for example here, Right, and at this marker, we can see that this individual, let's switch to white again. So here at this single marker, this individual has the BFMI allele from the father and the BFMI allele from the mother, right? And if we would look at a different type of marker, so a marker that is located here, now we see that it has a BFMI allele from the father and a B6 allele from the mother. And we call this a heterozygote. So generally we just shorten this down to BFMI, right? So this marker is a BFMI marker because both alleles come from BFMI. And here we have a marker for which one of the chromosomes comes from BFMI and the other chromosome comes from B6. Um, we can look at this marker here, right? So if we have a marker here, then here we see that now it's the opposite because we have a B6 and then we have an allele coming from BFMI, and that now means that we are also heterozygous, right? So in total, in these mice, these mice can have three different states. So they can be BFMI totally, they can be heterozygous, having a BFMI and a B6 allele, or they can be having a pure B6 allele, um, which happens here in the middle in the blue part, right? Where both alleles come from. So every genetic marker in each individual has three different states. You can have BFMI state, you can be a heterozygote, which is a mix of both parents, or you can be B6. So now we don't do this just for one individual, but we do this for 500 individuals at the same time. Right, so 500 times we just cross these mice, or we generate 500 offspring from these from these two mice, um, and then every individual have these breakpoints at different points in the genome. Right, so at a certain point, um, let me get a new slide. So when we look at a population, and I'm just now going to draw one side of the allele. So if I have individual one, oh, um, crap, crap, crap. I'm still learning how to use my pen thing so I will be better next next week so um, so we have for example individual one two three and four and we for example have marker one marker two and marker three right so now the first individual at the first marker can be BFMI completely right this individual happened to be heterozygous here, the third individual also happened to be in this heterozygous, and the fourth individual is a B6, right? At marker 2, we can have this one being BFMI, um, this one is now also BFMI, and this one is still a heterozygous, and this one also is BFMI, right? So when we do QTL mapping, we measure all a phenotype of all of these individuals, right? So we have 500 individuals, so we have also 500 measurements, for example, the weight. And then what we do is at a single marker, we now group these in three groups. So we get a graph which looks like this. So we have BFMI individuals, 
we have heterozygous individuals and we have B6 individuals. And now if we look across the population we can see a structure which looks like this, right? Where we have measurements of the one, we have measurements of the other, and we have measurements of the B6 group. And now what we see is we now see that there's an association, right? So we can just do linear regression and we see that depending on if you get the BFMI allele or if you get the B6 allele, you're either a very fat mouse or you're a very, very lean mouse. And this is an additive effect, right? So this is additive, right? Because every B6 allele decreases your phenotype by a certain amount of points, right? So for example, minus five grams. And here again, minus five grams. We can also have a different structure. So a different structure would be, for example, an additive structure and an additive or a, it would be a dominant structure. And that would mean that the picture would look something like this. This is going to be really, really shaky, but BFMIs, right? And now we have the heterozygotes and we have the B6s. All right, like this. And now we have a dominant structure, right? Because now we see that there's an effect of what allele you have. But as soon as you have one B6 allele, right? Because the heterozygous has a BFMI and a B6 allele. But now if you have one B6 allele, you are already lean. The B6s are also lean, but the individuals inheriting the BFMI allele become fat, right? So here we see an additive effect and here we see a dominance effect. Right, so this is dominant, and of course recessive is the inverse of dominant. So here we can say that the, that the BFMI allele is the recessive allele. That means that the B6 allele is the dominant allele. And I'm only using one of them, right? Because I'm writing BF, which means BFMI from father, BFMI from mother. Heterozygous means BFMI from father or mother, B6 from the other one, and B6 means two of these alleles. Is that clear? So QTL mapping is nothing more than this. And you don't do this for a single marker, but you do this for all markers in the genome. So you generally use like five, 600 markers, which are across the genome. And at every marker, you do this test. So you do this linear regression to see if there is an association between the marker that you are looking at and the phenotype that you have measured. And that is called QTL mapping. It's a very, very short introduction. Um, so. Let's switch back to our non-drawing board. So what multiple QTL mapping does is that it treats, so when you are looking at a certain marker, for example, marker 15, you are now including another marker from which you know that it has an effect into the model. And for example, we know that marker 60 has a big effect on the body weight of our mouse, but when we are now looking at marker 15, then we include marker 60 into the model because we know that marker 60 has a big effect, right? So by using multiple QTL mapping, we gain more power to detect genetic effects because we're not only looking at the individual marker, but we're looking at the marker here, but we're also compensating for the effect of a marker which might be on a different chromosome. So there's a lot of reasons why you want to use Q multiple QTL mapping, like accounting for known genetic effects. Um, you have more power to detect other effects because you're already catching some of the variants and putting it on chromosome six. And when you're mapping chromosome one, you don't have to deal with the variants that you already assigned to chromosome six. You can disentangle QTLs in close proximity, which is not that interesting. And you can deal with QTLs of opposite direction of effect, right? And Multiple QTL mapping is again a model selection approach. So you're looking at a model um, where you are saying that my phenotype is determined by the genotype at a certain marker, including when we correct for other markers into the model, right? And QTL are detected using the best model. So you first do a selection step saying that, well, I scan across the whole genome, find which markers have an influence, I build a model based on all of these markers that have an influence, and then I'm going to add all uh, the first marker to the model and see if it has an then the second, then the third, right? So you're, you're kind of continuously scanning across the genome, trying to find regions of interest. So how does this kind of look? So here we see a multiple QTL mapping. Um, so here we have three different models that we are using, right? We have 
two markers which we know are significantly influencing our phenotype, when I'm mapping in this region, so when I'm mapping for example this genetic marker, I have the model where I say, well I put this marker into the model plus this marker plus the marker that I'm currently mapping. When I'm in region 2, I'm saying, well, I'm taking this marker here and only including marker number 3, because I'm very close to this marker, so I'm not going to include it. So you have three different models here. So model 1 is include the marker at uh, the top marker at 2 and the top marker at 3. Here we are including only the top marker at, at 3, and here we are including the top marker at 2. So it's a very complex situation, um, but the, the, the multiple QTL mapping is just a way to get more uh, genetic variants explained uh, by looking at the current marker that we want to associate with the trade, but first compensating for the other markers that are in our trade. I really hope that the next slide is easy. Ha, good. Schön. So, machen wir diesen slide auf Deutsch. So, um, hier sieht man den ganz bekannte berlin fettmaus inbret linie So es ist ein Modellorganismus für Polygenic Obesity. Das, meint das, oder das bedeutet, dass diese Maus äh, nicht einen genetischen Locus hat, den den Fettmaß von den Maus determiniert. Aber es gibt verschiedene, Gen äh, verschiedene Stellen in das Genom, wo die äh, Fettnis von den Maus äh, durchmodelliert wird. Den Maus zeigt ein fünfmal, äh, ein, ein fünf, fünffache ähm, äh, Erhöhung von, von das äh, Fettpercentage, äh, äh, von das Fettprozentsatz in der Maus. So wenn man den Prozentsatz von einem B6-Maus sich anguckt, ist das zum Beispiel 2%, aber in einem Berlin-Fettmaus ist es dann 10%, so fünffach äh, höher. Ähm, diese Mäuse sind kreiert durch äh, Langzeitselektion für hohe Fettmaß. Ähm, aber den Maus ist interessant, weil es zeigt auch verschiedene Symptome von das metabolische Syndrom. So das metabolische Syndrom ist nicht nur ein Phänotyp, nicht nur Fettleibigkeit, aber es äh, bedeutet auch Insulinresistenz ähm, und auch andere Phänotypen, die äh, assoziiert sein mit Diabetes Typ 2. Ähm, so, was man hier sieht, ist den berlin Fettmaus, den, den dicke Maus hier und den, den kleine Maus. Das ist den Standard B6-Maus, das ist der Referenzmaus, äh, den jeder über den ganzen Welt nutzt. Hier sieht man ein Pie-Chart und hier in den Pie-Chart sieht man ungefähr, äh, wel, äh, wie viel Varianz äh, erklärt wird durch den verschiedenen Faktoren. So, man sieht, dass die Subfamilie Sub äh, zum Beispiel ein sehr höchst Teil von den Varianz erklärt. Ähm, man sieht auch, dass den, ähm, den, den Marker, so den genetischen Marker auf Chromosom 3, ein ganz großes Teil von den Varianz erklärt. Ähm, zum Beispiel Saison, ähm, so den, den äh, Jahreszeit, hat nicht so ein ganz großes Einfluss auf den Fettleibigkeit von den Berlin Fettmaus. Ähm, aber wenn man alles beieinander aufzählt, dann gibt es ungefähr 30% von den Varianz in den Fettleibigkeit, die nicht erklärt wird durch bekannte Faktoren. Und natürlich, was wir wollen, ist, dass wir auch diese 30%, die jetzt nicht erklärt werden kann, auch zuweisen können an Stellen an das Genom oder andere Kovarianten, die wir messen können. I think that went pretty well. So it's a model for polygenic obesity, meaning that there's just not one genetic locus, but multiple genetic loci. Um, there's a five-fold increase in fat percentage. Um, it has been long-term selected for high fat mass, and it has several features of the metabolic syndrome. So it's not just fat. It also has like an increase in liver triglycerides, but it also has things like um, insulin. Sens uh, it's not as sensitive to insulin. Um, so it's a very good model for people who have type 2 diabetes. Um, there is actually um, a lot of variants which we can already assign, but if we assign all of the variants that we know by, by now, uh, we see that there's also a big part of unexplained variants in, in the model. So we still see that 30% of the fatness of this mouse cannot be explained um, by general modeling. So that is what this whole presentation is about, is to find if we can explain slightly more of this unexplained variants in the mouse. 
So what do we have? So our material methods are 344 individuals um, who are in generation 28. So I just showed you like an example where we have an F1 and an F2. These individuals are F28. So there have been 28 generations of mixing the genomes of these mice, meaning that we have very very small regions of the genome and so there's a lot of recombinations that have occurred in these 28 uh, in, in these 28 generation in total we have like uh, 18,000 genetic markers so the whole genome of this mouse which has 20 chromosomes is is more or less tagged um, at around 18,000 markers right so the the genetic matrix um, so the very small matrix that I just drew is in this case we have 344 individuals and we have measured them at 18,000 positions across the genome and that for each individual we know where this allele came from so if this allele came from the Berlin fat mouse or if it came from the B6 mouse or if this mouse has two alleles at this position so the BFMI and the B6 one um, we have time series data on body weight um, so every every week we measure body weight starting from three weeks on so at three weeks um, so at day 21 we measure the mouse for the first time and then we measure them up to 70 days um, and every week we have a body weight measurement for this mouse all right, so now we have to do model selection, right? So model selection during this whole analysis we did using the uh, AKI information criterion, which is a, we talked about this, right? We have talked about it last, last week and today we also talked about it, but it is a model selection is the task of selecting a statistical model from a set of candidate models and the AIC can help us to, sh to uh, assess which model is the better model relative to the other one, right? And here we have to remember that the, the lower the AIC, the better our model is, based on the observed data. All right, so in the first case, we have to do a, a selection because we, we, I told you guys that we have litter size, which is the number of individuals in a single litter of mice, and then we have the litter number, right? So this is the nth litter of a female because a single female can, of course, not have one litter. It can have like three litters, but the first litter generally um, tends to be the smallest one and then the other litters tend to be very similar um, after the first one. Um, so we can encode this litter number in two different ways, right? We can say litter A, which is the first one, litter B, the second one, etc. But then we use five different levels because the, the one that the, the the most litters that an animal in our study had was five, um, so then we have to correct for five different levels. However, we can, since we know that there is an effect of the first litter and that the rest of the litters are very similar, we can also code it as being um, the first litter, so F versus N, not the first litter. Right? So instead of using five different levels and estimating five or four different effects relative to the standard, so one litter, um, we're now just going to say no, we're just going to estimate a single beta and this beta is going to tell us what the difference is between the first litter and then the following litters. Besides that, we then define something which is called litter type, which is a combination of the litter size and the litter number. So we can have, for example, LT5, um, so this is the litter using the five types, and we can have LT2, right? So we can say that A8 means this is the first litter and it had eight offspring. B10 means it's the second litter and it had 10 offspring. C12 means this is the third litter and it had 12 offspring. We can also code it differently, right? So we can say F8, so this is the first litter, eight offspring, N10, so not the first litter, 10 offspring. We can then say first litter, 10 offspring, not first litter, 12 offspring, right? So these are different ways of coding it. So when we look, then we have to do model selection. So the first thing that I'm going to do is say, I'm going to define my null model, right? So I'm going to include a random effect for each individual because we have measured individual multiple times, right? Because we have many different time points um, and every individual is measured at every time point. So then here we see uh, P, so our, our, uh, our response variable is called body weight and then we have F which is the ID of the father. And of course now we want to look and see which of our codings is the best 
right? So do we want to, so we have all of the different models um, where we say that we have P equals F, P equals father plus litter type coded as N2, father coded as litter type N5, or we have, so we have different ways of writing down the same information. And then if we do this, we can compare all of these models against each other and then what we do is we sum the AIC of each of the models uh, for so for the first model versus all the other models and of course we don't care about M0 but we then get an AIC drop and the model which shows the biggest AIC drop is the way that we want to encode litter type into our model right so in the end we learn that the best model is using M2 underscore LT2 which is M2 LT2 that means that we have write the model as being the phenotype so the the weight of the mouse is determined by the father so who is your father plus the litter coded as N and uh, plus the litter type 2 so litter type 2 is um, this one, so it's F first versus not, like so LT2, so the way here. So writing it down like this gives us the best statistical power and gives us the most accurate model in determining what the influence is of the litter size and the litter number. But we combine them in a single variable so that we don't have to fit two different variables with different levels. Um, so that's just the way that we did the model selection here. So this is our best way of writing it down. And then the, mo the, the, the second best way is ML2. Um, so um, is M2L2. So M2L2, which means that you take this structure. So then we have litter type in there twice, right? So we take one variable for the litter number, and then we take one variable for the litter size. So keeping them separate. The next thing that we want to do is model our growth curves, right? Because we have growth curves, so we want to model these growth curves. And then we do stepwise model selection, and an AIC drop of more than 10 is considered a model improvement. So we start off with the model that we just found. So we say that the, the fatness of our mouse is determined by who is your father plus LT2. And we include a random effect for individuals. So this is our first model that we are going to use. And then the next model is, is that we're going to say, well, now I'm going to add season into the model and like we saw before season doesn't have a big effect and we can also see that because when we include season into the model we see that the AIC actually doesn't drop the AIC goes up meaning that season should not be a fixed effect in our model so we we then do the next model saying that we include t time right which is logical because we have a time series model so we want to include time into our model and when we do that we see that when we include time in our model um, as a fixed effect then we see that the AIC drops around 4700 points um, so of course time should be included as a fixed effect then the next thing that we're going to test is to see if time should be included also as a random slope right I told you that every individual um, has, so every individual has its own intercept, meaning that the birth weight of each individual is unique. Um, but of course, every individual can also have its own kind of growth curve, right? You can imagine that males might grow, grow quicker than females across time as a linear component. Um, so when we include time as a random slope into our model, um, we see indeed a massive drop in AIC meaning that time should indeed be included as a random slope effect. We then say, because growth curves tend to not be an exact linear line, right? So we also might want to include time as a square effect, right? So the next model that we're going to try is say, well, your, your fatness is determined by your father plus your litter type plus the time plus time to the power of two and we also allow time to be a random effect as well as the fact that we have repeated measurements for every individual so that every individual has its own intercept and time to the power of two should indeed be included as a fixed effect we do the same thing for time to the power of three and that should be a fixed effect as well and then when we include time to the power of four we see that the model doesn't improve anymore so that means that with time plus time to the power of two plus time to the power of three we have our best explaining model um, and of course the next step is to include the main 
main uh, locus, right? Because we have this one region in the genome, which explains a massive amount of the variance. So we also have to put that into the model. So we put the marker into the model and we also include the marker by time effect. Um, so an interaction between the marker and time, right? So at the start of your birth, you have this marker has a certain effect on your weight. Um, so if you get this marker from the BFMI, you tend to be more fat than the other mice. Um, but if you have this marker, um, then this marker is also allowed to modulate um, based on the time curve. It might be that when you start off bigger, you grow actually slightly, uh, slightly shorter. So and this is our top marker and uh, it should also be included and it should be included with time as an interaction as well. So now when we want to visualize these things, right? So the first model, right, is, is, is the, the first model that we're looking at is just the basic model y equals mean. Right, so here we see all of our data points. So here we see all of our 300 something mice at each time point. And what we are looking at is just zero. Uh, so zero days after we started weighing. So this is three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks. And we see indeed that the, the, the mice are starting to grow. And we see that every time that they grow, the variance also becomes bigger, right? So there seems to be some heteroscedacity in our, in our measurements. So the first model that we have is P equals mu plus the repeated measure of the individual. And then, of course, the mean is estimated here. So you see the line for the mean, right? So we estimate the global mean. So we're just going to talk to all of these different models that we had, right? So the next thing that we want to do is include time in the model, right? So here we see the model where we say estimate the average and then include time as a component. So now we see that across time, animals tend to get bigger, which is logical, right? And we already saw from the model selection that time should be included into the model. And so we go from a, from a model where we have individuals just being predicted by the mean and of course having massive residuals, not a very good fitting model. And we, when we include time into the model, we see that time starts, it now starts fitting the data points better than the previous model. We also saw that we have to include time as a squared parameter as well. So, and then the model starts looking like this, right? And we already see that now the predicted body weight of the average mouse seems to fit already quite well to the distribution, right? Just using the model where we say that your, your body weight is determined by the mean body weight across the whole experiment plus time plus time to the power of two. And of course, I'm not showing you the random effects because then you would have 300 something lines in the plot and you wouldn't see really what's going on um, because each mouse is allowed to have its own intercept, right? And also its own personal growth curve. Um, so its own personal like time curve. So again, like this model fits already relatively well. So now what we are going to do, we're going to include time to the power of three and that will add a, a little bit more, right? So you can see that the difference is not that big between the two models, but it, it catches some of the variance. And this is because growth curves tends to tend to kind of follow an S shape, right? You, you grow a lot in the beginning, and then when you get older, you tend to not grow as much anymore, right? So based on these two, you can see that at this model, um, it doesn't improve that much, but it improves significantly, right? So it's, it's a relatively minor change. Then the next thing what we are going to do, of course, is include this main locus that we have into our model. And then we start, oh, uh, first things we are going to include the different families, right? I'm, I told you that father has a massive effect. So now each father is a different line. So you see the line here. And now for each of the father, we, 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 we allow every father to have an effect of an, on its offspring and then it happens or then it shows you like this. So there are different families and each of these lines represent the, the, the growth curve of animals within this one family. And this reduces variance even more. All right, so then the next thing what we are going to do is now include our top marker into the model. And when we, again, not the top marker, I'm so sorry. Um, oh, the litter type. So uh, we go from having a model like this, where we have the family in, then we also include the litter type into the model. So when we include litter type into the model, um, we see that the, the model starts fitting a lot better. And we see that almost all variance at three weeks is more or less explained by this model. But we see that there's still a lot of unexplained variance when we look at the later time points. 
So what do we do next? Next we include the top marker, so the JOB's one locus, so this, this region on chromosome 3, which we know is influencing the body weight on the mouse, depending if you got it from the B6N or if you got it from the BFMI. Right, so the BFMI, if you're at, at this position on chromosome 3, you inherited the loci from the BFMI, then you are more or less determined by the, by the orange lines, and if you are B6N or heterozygous, then these are the lines. And you can see now that going from this model, which does not include the top marker, to the model which includes the top marker, we see a, a really good increase or a really nice um, um, fit of the model. So the model starts fitting better and better and better to the data that we have observed. And of course I'm still not showing you the random effects because the random effects would just add a whole bunch of lines. So for each mouse you would have a, a, have a unique line which is not that interesting. So now what do we do? We now start scanning around the genome, right? Because we now have our minimal model, right? These things need to be included before we can start evaluating a marker on chromosome 1. So that is what we're going to do next. So now what we are going to do is we're going to take this whole big model and then say plus SNP1, plus marker 2, plus marker 3, plus marker 4. And at every time we are going to compare this model which has the current marker in there, so marker 2 for example, to the model which does not have marker 2 in there. So hey, we're just going to do a new model like 19,000 times because we have 19,000 markers across the genome and for each of these markers we're just going to compare the new model that we create to the old model and see what the increase, what the probability is of inputting this marker into the model. Then if we look at, um, uh, for example, chromosome 1, so we add the marker under consideration to the model. So here we, uh, each of these dots here is a marker, and at each marker we look to see what the improvement is in the model compared to the standard model, and we express this as a lot score. So a lot score is the minus log 10 of the p-value, right? That means that a, that a score of like 8 here means that this is 1 times 10 to the minus 8. Um, 4 means 1 times 10 to the minus 4 and we see here for example 1 times 10 to the minus 1 so 0 0.1. We also have two lines in this plot and these are the significant lines so um, if we look at the orange line the orange line is 0 0.05 and the green line is 0 0.01. So if, if, the, if the score of the marker is way above the green line, it means that this locus here has an influence besides the JOB's locus. So it's not just the locus on chromosome 3, but there's also one region on chromosome 1, which in this model seems to have a direct effect on the body weight of our mice. So we scan all of the chromosome and then we detect five additional QTL in our mice um, and what we see is we see this standard JOB's locus so that's located on chromosome 3. Um, it starts here, it ends here, so it's a very small region, only like 300 KB. And this is the top marker that we included and you can see here for example all of the effects relative to the B6N. And we also see the number of alleles that we have, so we see the amount of like animals that got BFMI, BFMI, we see the amount of animals that got B, BFMI, B6, and we see the amount of animals we got B6, B6. Right, and then here we see not only the main direct effect, but we see also the growth effect over time in grams. Right, so if you are heterozygous, you start off being like 0 0.8 grams bigger, compared to a B6, or an animal which has a B6 at this locus, and um, if you are a BFMI, you're 0 0.4 grams bigger than a mouse which has a B6 locus. Um, but here what we see is that when, um, eh, when we look at the growth curve, we see that the increase for uh, the heterozygous per day, it means that, that these animals are not growing as fast as a B6N animal. So this locus, although the, the, the effect is, is positive for BFMI and the heterozygous, it, the, the effect on the curve is actually a negative effect. So the, it, 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 it slows down your growth compared to a fully B6N animal at this position. So five new QTLs detected, that's really, really good because we haven't found any new QTLs in these animals for a long time. 
Um, so there's uh, this is this massive JOBs one locus which you see here, um, and then when we do the LMM mapping, we see that this is the standard curve. And so in in the in the um, when we do not correct for this massive locus here, then we would get the dotted line. But when we do this new ma new mapping method where we say that we we use the linear mix model combined with multiple QTL mapping, you see that something strange happens and you see that this big effect is still there, but you see now that here an another effect is there which used to be hidden in the massive effect of this JOBs1 locus. Yeah, because this JOBs1 locus is associated, so it shows like a big region, um, but if we compensate for this locus we see that a new um, region occurs here and a new region occurs here at the beginning. So Originally, they did not seem to be associated, or they seem to be associated uh, here. They did not seem to be associated. This locus was associated, but not, but was kind of swallowed up in this massive effect of this chromosome three uh, of this JOB's QTL. So now we want to look what what's actually underneath this peak right and then here we zoom in so we zoom in here we see the association again so we see that it's associated above the orange line so it is a significant effect and what we now see is here on the genome I've plotted the different genes and what we see is that in the middle of this um, QTL more or less we see a massive dip in the association and this massive dip in the association is because one of the genotype groups is completely missing there is no animal here which is found which is actually a B6, B6 individual. So for some reason being B6, B6 at this locus you can't because you, you probably die prematurely so you never get born or there's some other effect going on here. Hey, but this kind of drop shows us what actually the causal gene is. We can now conclude that this FOXO1 gene here is the gene which is driving the effect of this of this of this region on the genome. So it's a very nine, nice way of, of of looking at growth curves, modeling growth curves and then looking at each marker in the genome and seeing if they are actually um, still associated. So we see that there's an association but we see that this association is gone in this region because the effect is a dominant effect and this dominant effect is not here because the, the B6 group which is carrying the effect relative to the other two groups there are no mouse which are not there are no mice which have this locus homozygous B6N. So FOXO1 is a well-known regulator of insulin so it makes a lot of sense that this gene has an influence in our fat mice compared to the lean mice um, and when we look at it, yeah, so here we see the whole insulin signaling pathway from CAG, uh, we actually see that this FOXO1 gene is more or less a central regulator of insulin um, when you have the insulin receptor pathway all the way down to starting up uh, glycolysis or uh, lipogenesis. And in the other regions that we de that we defined, we also find genes which all belong to this pathway. So that makes makes us very confident that this method is really able to very accurately pinpoint which genes are causing the obesity in our Berlin fat mouse, or which are the loads which are protecting the B6 from becoming fat. So. LMM time series mapping is much, much more sensitive than just using LMM mapping. So had the, the addition of MQM to the LMM part is, is, um, is, is much more sensitive. And that comes because it uses all the available data and it allows you to correct for known large genetic effect. We detect five novel QTLs um, within this NR3 region. We observe segregation distortion, which occurs exactly on top of this FOXO1 gene um, and many genes from the insulin pathway are located underneath these newly identified QTLs making us think that this obesity is driven by um, mutations in genes in the insulin pathway. All right so that was it for today. Um, so and this is the way that I use more or less this modeling right. So we start off with a very basic model just saying that fat phenotype is determined by the overall mean. Then we add a factor, time, which of course has an influence when you look at a growth curve. 
we model, we say time to the power of 2, time to the power of 3. Then we add family into the model, we add the litter type into the model, and then we add our main top marker into the model. And at each step, you see that our prediction increases with enough certainty to make sure that these models are correct. And this is more or less how you model one of these very complex phenotypes and measured across like seven different time points have, using a lot of mice, using a lot of genetic information. And so you just start small and then build up one by one, and include things that you think might have an effect and test. And that's why we have this little graph here where we say that, well, we, we add season into the model and the model doesn't become better. So we don't include it after that. Time should be, time to the power of two should be, and, and, and we, we also in swap from using only individual as a random intercept, so every individual is allowed to have its own birth weight, to saying that no, every individual is allowed to have its own birth weight, but also is allowed to have its own individual growth curve, so its own slope model. All right, I hope that that's interesting. Um, so uh, during the, the first hour, we talked about the assignments. The second hour was more or less showing you how you kind of build up one of these models using a example data set or using the, the tutorial by Bodo Winter. And here I show you how I applied that tutorial to the data that we collect here in our own group. and, and how we apply linear mixed models to our own research to do stuff which we couldn't do before. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I've been talking almost for three hours and it's my holiday. Holiday! Holiday! So I'm off for a week. Um, we will have a lecture next week, of course. Um, I will do that from Holland. Um, so I will probably be sitting somewhere in my underwear um, but you won't see that, of course. I could be sitting in my underwear now and you wouldn't even know. Um, anyway, I will, I, I, I'd like to thank you for listening to me, being here. Um, I thank everyone for the different remarks and questions. Um, and, uh, you can pack more than underwear. I know, I know, I know, but why should I? It's a holiday. Have a lekker holiday. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Um, if there's any questions, then uh, feel feel free to ask them. 